Okay, so let's move to a, a second possible principle. Let's assume that we ignore the past entirely, not just up to 1992, but we ignore it entirely. And we just look at what's happening right now, what nations are emitting now. So then what we do is we say, well, we just want to divide up the atmosphere, and the fairest way to do this is on an equal share basis, right? So this is what you do when you have an apple pie. You have 20 people who would all like a big slice of the, uh, as big a slice of the pie as they can get because they're hungry and it looks like a very tasty pie. So the simple solution is just to say, well, we'll divide it into 20 equal slices. None of us will get as much as we want, but that's the fairest thing to do, or at least if it's not completely fair, because maybe some people are hungrier than others, but still it's a rough and ready way of achieving fairness when it would take forever to try to sort out or maybe we would never get agreement on who is hungrier, who needs it more, uh, something of that sort, who has worked harder to uh, uh, contribute to it, all of those things might be relevant. But the present world situation is certainly not one in which we have equal slices. So if, if you had this situation that somebody took a slice as big as that when there were 20 people who wanted it, you would say that's grossly unfair. Well, I don't know exactly how big that slice was in the photograph I had, but the United States is roughly 1 20th, slightly less than 1 20th of the world's population now. Um, but we emit about 16% of the uh, greenhouse gases. So at least we're taking a slice at least three times, slightly more than three times as big as we ought to have on an equal per capita share basis. Um, China on the other, uh, also is taking slightly more now. This wouldn't have been true if you'd looked at this maybe as recently as 10 years ago. Um, but China is now emitting more than its per capita share. But uh, as you can see from that, maybe it's emitting 50% uh, more. So it's about 50% in excess, not 300% not, uh, in excess as the United States. And India, the other nation that George W. Bush mentioned, is way under its per capita share. India is emitting less than half its per capita share at this point. And you know, it's, it's obviously connected with a degree of industrialization, a degree to which the country is uh, electrified, degree to which people are driving cars, um, and uh, uh, matters of that sort. It's also, as we'll talk about more later, it's um, linked to agricultural production as well, um, because that is also a source of greenhouse gas emissions, especially livestock production. So on this basis, then, you could say, uh, just as on the first principle of historical responsibility, the US is, is emitting more than it should, on this basis too, which in one way is more favorable to the US, um, it's still emitting very substantially more than it should be. Um, and if we look at this more broadly, in terms of developed and developing nations, um, we uh, see that in general the developed nations are emitting um, much more. These are, the, as I mentioned, the Annex B nations, the ones that were covered by the Kyoto Protocol in terms of having quotas set, are emitting on average uh, three tons of uh, uh, carbon, and the developing nations, the non-Annex B nations, are emitting on average 1.8 tons. So we are emitting much more than they are, and that includes uh, nations that are emitting significantly less than the United States, like the European nations generally uh, have fewer emissions uh, per capita than the United States. And here's another way of looking at this equal per capita shares idea. This is a somewhat complicated slide. It comes out of this uh, German government advisory body, Advisory Council on Climate Change. And what they did is this. Um, you remember that the uh, Rio Declaration talked about avoiding dangerous anthropogenic climate change, and scientists think that 2% of warming would uh, exceed, would, would lead us into that area of dangerous climate change. We ought not to exceed 2%. So, they calculated how much carbon can be emitted into the atmosphere 
by 2050 if we are to avoid exceeding 2 degrees Celsius global warming by 2050. Um, and so this is the budget, if you like. And then they divided it up, the total budget, sorry, I haven't, I haven't given you the figure for the, the total budget here. Oh, there, there it is, this is the budget, sorry, 750, um, 750 uh, billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Um, so uh, then they divided up among the countries on a per capita basis as to um, how much they can emit. That's the budget. Then they looked at their emissions in 2008. The, this, this was done a couple of years ago, so that was the most recent one for which they had figures. And then it's a simple calculation. Once you know what their share of the world budget is, their equal per capita share of the world budget, and once you have these, um, how much they're emitting at the moment, um, then you can work out how quickly they're going to exhaust their budget. Exhausting their budget would mean that on a fair share view, their emissions have to be zero from the date they've exhausted their budget until 2050. Okay? So, um, the bad news is obviously that the world as a whole is not on track to stay within that budget because it's going to exhaust its budget to 2050 in 25 years. 25 years from 2008, um, obviously it's going to be, have to be zero emissions for um, a substantial period there. Um, it's much worse for the United States. The United States um, if this was 2008 figures, well, we have slightly reduced our emissions actually for a variety of reasons, one of which is the substitution of um, natural gas for coal as a fuel. Um, but uh, so maybe this figure of six actually goes up to seven or something like that, um, but it's not going to go up very much. So we would be very soon, within uh, a couple of years, we would be likely to exhaust our global budget on this view and then have to have again zero emissions. 2050. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, look at one of the poorest developing nations, Burkina Faso, um, impoverished African nation. Um, it's not going to exhaust its budget for another 2,892 years, um, which just shows, if you like, how slanted, how unfair the uh, world is divided up on this equal per capita share view. That some nations are gobbling up their, their share within uh, six or ten years, um, uh, even, say, China in 24 years. But uh, Burkina Faso is going to take thousands of years at its present rate. So that's uh, one aspect of how slanted the emissions are, how some nations are con really still greatly contributing to this problem, and other nations are not and really never have contributed anything significant to it. Uh, so, um, all right, I'm going to have to move uh, quickly through some of these objections. Uh, one problem with allocating budgets on a per capita basis is that it might encourage nations to have uh, increased their population because then they get a larger share. Um, so it's been suggested we might use projections to 2050 rather than current population. And in that way, you create an incentive for countries, actually, to reduce their population growth. Because they'll have a larger per capita share if their population doesn't reach the projections to 2050. There's a UN body that has projections of growth for every country. So that might be one way of dealing with that question. And some people will say, well, why are we distributing this to states? Why not distribute this to individuals? So if we're talking about equal per capita share, let's give everybody their share. It's actually been suggested by um, a couple of uh, environmentalists um, that everybody should have a kind of a little card, like a credit card, which somehow calculates their carbon footprint and their emissions, and at some point it would say, sorry, you've used up your credit, um, can't uh, do any more. But it's very hard to see how that could actually be made practically to work. So in practical terms, I think it has to be done through states or it's not going to be done at all. Now, some people may say, well, some countries just need more fuel. We have any Canadians here? Um, so, you know, you just need more fuel to keep warm in winter up there. Um, and so here's one answer to this, which may seem a little harsh to those of you from northern latitudes. You're imposing a cost on the rest of the world if you do that. If you use fossil fuels in particular to, heat, to keep yourself warm in winter, 
you're affecting other nations. You're, you know, okay, so these Pacific Islanders certainly don't need to keep themselves warm. They have a very balmy climate, but by you keeping yourself warm, um, you are actually helping to inundate their nations and they'll become refugees. So it has to be done in a way, if you like. If you don't like it, try to move somewhere warmer um, and you won't have to use those fossil fuels. I just want to mention the third of the principles and all I'm going to do is mention it. This is a principle associated with John Rawls, uh, perhaps the best known political philosopher of the 20th century, um, who suggested that justice involves giving priority to those who are worse off. The principle sometimes called maxi min because you should maximize the minimum level, the worst level. So it doesn't take very much thought to realize that that principle is also not going to favor the developed countries. The United States and other developed countries are much better off than the poorest nations. So on that view too, um, we ought to be dramatically reducing our greenhouse gases more than poorer nations, more than India, for example, in particular, more than uh, Burkina Faso or other nations. So what I've suggested is, on any of these three principles, the burden of responsibility really ought to rest with us, with the wealthier developing nations. 